Led Zeppelin and the Backstreet Boys. What do all these bands have in common? They rock. <laughs> they are all bands who are reunited after calling it quits. Let's open in prayer. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this day that you have made, and we will rejoice and we'll be glad in this day, and we thank you that your mercies are new every morning. That is such a, a precious promise, and we thank you for that, Lord. Lord, we just ask you to have your way in the house today, to speak into our hearts, Father God, that the word would speak to us right where you are right now, what is relevant to us in our situation, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. So today's message is titled, Is It Worth Getting Back Together? Now, the, wor the world may say one thing, but the word says another. So have you ever thought about reconnecting with someone that you were once close to, whether it was a close friend, colleague, or even maybe a family member? Show of hands, how many in the house have siblings? Hands going up everywhere. How many of you in the house today have lost touch with a friend or a family member? There's lots of hands. So maybe you've grown apart, maybe it was a disagreement, or maybe it was just a change of life that took place. Because over time, you know, we can just grow apart. But we start our careers, we start our own families, the years go by, and we just go our own separate ways. We chart our own course. I think that can happen to many of us. It's not always intentional that we've grown apart or gone our separate ways, but we believe that this year is the year of open doors. And one of those open doors is to reach out to a loved one and say, I'm sorry, I love you, I'd like to make an effort to reconnect. I've been convicted of that in this series that we've done. I've reached out to some people. I still have one more to reach out to. And it's a family member. Some things happened many years ago. And I need to reach out to her. And I need to just let her know that I love her. And hopefully we can reconnect. So let's think back to when you were a kid. <clears throat> and for some of us, that was a long time ago. I'm still a kid. I'm just in an adult body now. <laughs> right? So if you had siblings or close friends, you probably had no idea how much those interactions then would affect and who you are today and how you interact with others now. It's proven that how we treat one another in our younger years will have a direct effect on how we treat others later on in life. So when you were a child, the way you were raised and what you were taught to, you know, to treat, how you were taught to treat your family and friends will actually have a direct effect on how you will interact with people in your future whether it be your family, your friends, coworkers, or even how you interact with strangers. By the age of 10, you will have established the core of your foundational beliefs. So that means those foundations, those core foundations, what you think about who people are, and what you believe you can or cannot do, or maybe what life is all about, all of these things are established by the age of 10. So this is why it is so important for us to invest into our children. Teaching them through the scriptures who they are in Christ and what they're actually capable of. Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. So raising and training a child within the context of this proverb means that it begins with the Bible. Because as 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all scripture is uh, inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make, us what is to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. Teaching children the truth of scripture will make them wise for salvation. It will thoroughly equip them to do good works. It will prepare them to give an answer to everyone who asks them the reason for their hope. you find that in 1 Peter 3.15. And teaching them through the scriptures will prepare them to withstand the onslaught of cultures. 
Cultures that are bent on indoctrinating young people with worldly values. Okay, so many of our habits were shaped long ago in our younger years and are connected to an even deeper belief system. For example, maybe you were taught how to resolve conflict. I wasn't taught that. Uh, maybe you were taught how to handle miscommunication. I wasn't taught that either. Uh, or maybe you, need, uh, maybe you were taught how to put the needs above, of others above your own. <clears throat> I didn't get taught any of these things. I did get taught some good stuff, but these things I had to learn later on in life. Actually, for me, it was after Jesus became my Lord was when I started to learn these things. God designed families to be there for each other, to support one another, and to build each other up. And we don't often think of our younger years as training for the rest of our lives. But you know, the Bible was built on family relationships. <clears throat> and if you've read through the Bible, you'll see that it is full of dysfunctional families. Lying, cheating, deception, rejection, as well as broken and restored relationships. So today, we're going to look at some of our great family history. And that includes past hurts and healings. And it's the story of Abraham's family, specifically his son Isaac, Isaac's sons, Jacob and Esau. And my cup doesn't match my shirt today, so I've got to change the light. That's, there we go. Oh, what's going on here? Okay, there we go. Blue. I'm wearing a blue shirt, so that's important. We learned that last week. <laughs> cup needs to be the same color as the shirt. Okay, so if you guys brought your Bibles with you today, hold them up in the air, whether they're papal, look it up, Bibles are coming up everywhere, right on. <clears throat> so we're going to turn to Genesis 25, and we're going to start with a struggle that was going on inside a pregnant woman whose name was Rebecca. So Genesis 25, verses 22 to 23, and it says this, the, baby, the babies jostled each other within her. And she said, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. That's the first thing she did. She went straight to God. That's what we need to do. Whatever situation we're in, whatever we're faced with, the first things that we should do, the first thing we should ask, what does the word say? What does God's word say about this situation? And then the Lord said to her, he answered her, and he'll answer you. Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples will, with, from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. So our first point today is, why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to me? Are you asking that question right now? Now, maybe it's just the way you're asking the question, because questions shape focus. Maybe it's not happening to you. Maybe it's happening for you. Say, it's happening for me. It's happening for me. All right, <laughs> we've got a couple. Say it again. It's happening for me. Happening for me. All right. Okay, it's happening for you or to you. The Lord answered Rebecca, and he said there was something greater going on inside of her. But there was a struggle taking place, a struggle that would burst something big, so big it would affect generations to come. And that something was two nations. So then God... He makes a key statement here. He said, the older will serve the younger. Now, this challenged both their customs and their culture because traditionally, the older one would get the birthright and the blessing, and all his younger siblings would serve him. So how many of you know that when Christ comes into the picture, he really has a way of messing with our methods, right? He messes with our systems. He messes with our beliefs. So God said, the older one will serve the younger. So as you go through this story, and I encourage you to read this story on your own at home. We're not going to have time to go through the whole thing today. But you're going to see some belief systems that they grew up in, along with the tensions they faced because, the because of the environment they were in. And God was messing with their methods. So we're going to continue on reading in the Bible. And we're going to read from Genesis tw uh, 25, and we're going to start in verse 24. I'm going to be reading out of this one. It's the New King James Version. So we're going to start with verse 24. So when her days were fulfilled for her to give birth, indeed there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red. 
He was like a hairy garment all over. So they called his name Esau, which means hairy. <laughs> his name means hairy. Afterward, his brother came out and his hand took hold of Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob, which means supplanter or deceiver. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. So the boys grew and Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field. But Jacob was a mild man dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game. But Rebekah loved Jacob. They had favorites. The parents had favorites. So we'll go down to verse 29. And this, where are we here? Verse 20. Yeah, this is where Jacob steals Esau's birthright. Now Jacob cooked a stew, and Esau came in from the field, and he was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, Please feed me with that same red stew, for I am weary. Therefore his name was called Edom. But Jacob said, Sell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, Look, I'm about to die, so what is this birthright to me? Then Jacob said, Swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils. Then he ate and drank, arose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. A little tip. Don't make any big decisions when you're hungry. <laughs> and don't go to the grocery store when you're hungry because you're going to make a lot of poor choices. Not a good idea. <laughs> okay, so later on in the story, when Isaac is on his deathbed, the time has come for Esau to receive the blessing the blessing from his father. And in Genesis 27, 3, Isaac says to Esau, take your bow and quiver full of arrows and go out into the open country to hunt some wild game for me. Prepare for me my favorite dish and bring it for me here to eat. Then I will pronounce the blessing that belongs to you, my firstborn son, before I die. Now it goes on to say in verse 5 and 6 that Rebekah overheard what Isaac had said to his son Esau. So when Esau left to hunt for a wild game, she said to her son, Jacob, listen, I overheard your father say to Esau. So she says to Jacob, listen to me and do exactly as I tell you. So she instructs Jacob to pose as his older brother Esau. So he puts on his older brother's clothes so that he'd smell like him. She even puts goat hair coverings on his, uh, on his arms and his neck because he was hairy, right? Esau was hairy to make uh, Isaac think that it was, that it was Esau. Then she said to him, deliver the food that I have made for you in order to trick Isaac into blessing Jacob instead of Esau. And it works. Jacob is obedient to his mother. Isaac falls for it. And he gives the blessing to Jacob. Now remember, he's the younger brother. Supposed to go to the older brother. And even later on, after Isaac finds out that he was deceived by Jacob, he cannot and will not take the blessing back. It is done. In verse 41 of Genesis 27, it says, Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. He said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are near. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. That's pretty heavy. I will kill my brother Jacob. So this brings us to our second point. Are you holding a grudge? Am I holding a grudge? Now a grudge is a feeling of deep-seated resentment or ill will, usually is resulting from a past insult or injury. We have all had reasons to hold grudges. People wrong us, situations hurt us. Even God doesn't always do what we think he should do, so we get angry. We hold offenses against those who have wronged us, and sometimes even against God, when we think he should have done things differently. You know, a grudge is really nothing more than a refusal to forgive. And God takes grudges so seriously that he included a specific commandment about them when he gave the law to the Israelites. It says in Leviticus 19, verse 18, Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself I am the Lord. So notice that God ended this commandment with the word, I am your Lord. So I believe that he did that because he wants to remind us that he's the Lord, not us. We're not the Lord, he is. 
And to hold a grudge is to set ourselves up as judge and jury. We determine that the person who has wronged us should not be forgiven. And no human, none of us, has the right or the authority to do that. Only God does. Now, in Romans 12, 19, it says this, Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it's mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. You know, even though we're born-again believers, we still have a sinful nature. And because of that, we have this struggle that is within us. And it says in Galatians 5.17, this is the NLT version, the sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the spirit wants. And the spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out to your good intentions. So it is impossible for us to seek vengeance with absolute pure motives. The only one who carry out justice with pure motives is God, only him. He's the ultimate judge. And knowing and believing this should give us comfort when we are wrong, as, f as well as the freedom to let it go. Let it go. Give it to God. When we hold a grudge against another person, maybe it's a business, maybe even a church, for something that has happened in the past, many times that will cause us to distance ourselves from others. And if we're not careful, their fault will become our filter. So instead of becoming better, we become bitter because we hold on to that thing. And that thing was never ours, never meant for us to hold on to. It was not ours to hold on to. So the Bible says we are to forgive. We are to let it go and give it to God. We are to cast our cares upon him. But instead, what do we do? We hold on to that grudge. Now, misunderstanding forgiveness can keep us in bondage to grudges. We might think that to forgive is an excuse is an excuse is to excuse sin. Sorry, is is to excuse sin or pretend that the offense didn't matter. And neither one of those things is true. Forgiveness is not about the other person. We talked about this before. Forgiveness is like taking poison and hoping the other person dies. But forgiveness is actually a gift from God. It's a gift to release us from the control of someone that has hurt us. Because when we hold a grudge. We give that person power over our emotions. Now think about that. Without forgiveness, just the thought of that person who hurt us, it can send acid to our stomachs and make our faces go hot. I have experienced this many times in my life, you know, when I'm holding a grudge or when I don't have forgiveness. But when we forgive, we give it to God. We give him any right to vengeance or restitution. Forgiveness puts our relationship with God back in proper alignment. We acknowledge that he is the judge and not us. And that he has to re he's got the right to make any resolution he chooses. Forgiveness is simply the choice to trust God in the matter. Now we may struggle with trusting or letting others into our lives. And over time we distance ourselves from others. And in doing so... We distance ourselves from the people who want to make time for us. We, we may find ourselves moving from place to place, relationship to relationship. That's the way I used to live in, in my old, like, Rick, Rick, B.C., bouncing from place to place, going from relationship to relationship, experiencing the same letdown because we allow the fault to become our filter, the hurt, the resentment. And unless we deal with the unforgiveness in our hearts, we're not going to move forward. We're going to get stuck. And we won't just miss out on the time that God has given for us. Others are missing out on time with us. So it's very important to remember that forgiveness and reconciliation are two different things. They're not the same thing. Forgiveness is a matter of the heart. It is an act of surrender to God's will and is primarily between us and God. We release to him our right to hang on to anger. Now, reconciliation, on the other hand, depends on the true repentance 
and proven trustworthiness of the offender. Right? We're to forgive, but at the same time, we need to keep protective boundaries in place until that person has proven over time that he or she is worthy of our trust. Trust is earned. Trust is not just given. It's something that is earned. People have to earn our trust. And, and we also have to remember this. As part of our healing, we must forgive. The Bible says that we are to be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God has forgiven us. And God's way is always to forgive as he has forgiven us. So with a simple act of our will, we can release a grudge. And we do this by giving the whole situation to God and letting it go. Forgiveness will bring healing to our souls and it will allow God to build his strength and character into our lives as we allow him to reign as our God. Okay, that was a lot. Because forgiveness is so important. It's, it's so important for us to let it go and to give it to God. Okay, so we're going to go back to Jacob and Esau. So Jacob has just deceived his father and has stolen Esau's blessing. But even after Isaac finds out that he was deceived by Jacob, Isaac still sends Jacob away, blessed, to find a wife. Why? Because love covers a multitude of sins. 1 Peter 4, 8 says, above all, say above all. Love each other deeply. We are to love each other deeply. And it goes on to say, because love covers a multitude of sins. Jacob's mom, Rebecca, she did not want him to marry a Hittite woman. She did not want her son going off and just marrying any woman. And if you're a parent, you'll understand that because we want the best for our kids, right? So Rebecca specifically did not want Jacob to marry a Canaanite woman, a Hittite woman. She wanted a good and godly woman for her son. So Rebecca even goes to the point where she says to Isaac, you'll find this in Genesis 27, if Jacob takes a wife from among the women of this land, from Hittite women like these, my life will not be worth living. So she asked her husband to bless Jacob and to send him off to get him the right woman. So because of the father's love for his bride, he blesses his son. Because of our heavenly father's love for his son, Jesus, we the church, the bride of Christ, are blessed. In Genesis 28, 3, Isaac says to Jacob, May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and increase your numbers until you become a community of peoples. He said he would become a community of peoples. Now, yes, some of us are broken, but we are still blessed. All of us might feel in a sense that we are broken in some way, but you are still blessed. Say, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Thank you. We are blessed. And that's our third point. Broken, but still blessed. You know, a father, mother never loses his or her love for his children, no matter what nasty things they may have done. We always look for the best and believe for the best in our kids. This is our Heavenly Father's love for us. It's his agape love. It's, it's his unconditional love. It's the kind of love that is described in, is, uh, and described in first thir- uh, 1 Corinthians 13. It's a kind of love that holds no record of wrong. A love that looks for the best, hopes for the best. It endures all things. And 1 John 4, 8 says that God is love. That's the kind of love we want to have. We don't want to go to that place where we don't hold grudges. We don't want to go there. We, we, we want to be able to let it go, and we want to give it to God. We don't give up on people. We give people up to God. So how would you feel? I was thinking about this. How would you feel if you were the other brother, if you were Esau? Right? He was deceived. He lost his birthright. He was robbed of the blessing from his father by his own brother. How would you feel? I might be a little bit upset. I'm sure there are some of us here that have been taken advantage of. I know I have. People have said things. Maybe somebody didn't follow through. Something was owed to you or maybe something was taken from you. 
will know this. The Lord, our God, is in the business of restoration. That is his business. And if you're willing to do it his way, that's key. He's going to give you a hundredfold whatever the enemy has stolen from you. Whatever he has robbed from you, just lay it down at God's feet. Lay it down at his feet and then watch as he restores everything that was robbed from you. This is the amazing God that we serve. All good things are from God and all things work together for good for those that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. We are all called according to his purpose and we are all loved by him. So we're going to go back to Esau, kind of jumping back and forth between these two guys. The Bible says, in 28, uh, Genesis 28, verse 6, this is the NLT version. It says that Esau knew his father, Isaac, had blessed Jacob and sent him to Paddan Aram to find a wife. And that he had warned Jacob, you must not marry a Canaanite woman. So remember, Esau was very upset and he wanted to kill his brother. And not only that, but the Bible says that he purposed to dishonor his mother for what she did by marrying a Canaanite woman. Okay, so he purposed to dishonor his mom by going out and marrying a Canaanite woman. Esau reacted to this situation based on his feelings and not by faith. He gets back at his mom by marrying a Canaanite woman. <clears throat> so has anyone here ever done anything like that? I have. Have you ever responded out of rebellion? I have. <laughs> I'm going to do this despite what my parents say. I'm going to marry that man. I'm going to be with that woman. I'm going to do that thing that my parents don't want me to do. Man, I am guilty of this. I'm going to do the wrong thing instead of the right thing. And I used to do that, and it was such a destructive thing in my life. Oh, man, it's terrible. So Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him to pat him around to find a wife. Now, he sent Jacob to go live with his uncle Laban, which is Rebekah's brother. And Laban had two daughters, Leah and Rebecca. Jacob goes there. He ends up falling in love with Rachel. And the Bible says that he was in love with Rachel. So when he told her father, I'll work for you for seven years if you give me Rachel, your younger daughter, as my wife. And Laban agreed to this agreement. Seven years? Sure. So Jacob worked the seven years to pay for Rachel. Now, when the seven years is completed, Jacob says to Laban, I have fulfilled my agreement. Now, give me my wife so I can sleep with her. That's scripture. It says that. <laughs> I didn't make that up. That's God's word. But now, seven years, man. It's been a long time, right? <laughs> Somebody got what I was saying. That's <laughs> faster. <Ron. laughs> right? So the, so the Bible goes on to say that Laban invited everyone in the neighborhood and prepared a wedding feast. But that night, when it was dark, Laban took Leah to Jacob, and he slept with her. Now, man, I don't know how much that guy had to drink that night, but he ends up with the wrong girl. <laughs> like, what? He ends up with the other sister. So what is, Laban tells Jacob that he can also have Rachel if he promises to work another 17, seven years. You know, we, we read through scriptures like this sometimes, seven years, and you just think about it. You know, you read on to the next one. Think about it, That's 14 years that he worked. I like to say for free because his, 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 his wages was his uh, two daughters. But, you know, 14 years, that's a long time, right? So he gets Rachel. Now, and Jacob experienced many difficulties in his life, and he had to struggle through. And he wasn't doing things exactly God's way, which is probably why he had a lot of the struggles, if anyone can relate to that. When we're not doing it God's way, things go a lot harder. However, God still did bless him. The Bible says that Jacob became exceedingly, exceedingly prosperous. Jacob had to struggle. And at one point, Jacob literally wrestled with God. And it's in that moment with wrestling with God that Jacob finally comes to the place of surrender. Pastor Ron was talking about surrender this morning because it says he wouldn't let him go. It says that Jacob said to God, I will not let you go unless you bless me. He wouldn't surrender. 
And here's the key thing. God says, God says to Jacob, who are you? So remember, Jacob has always been the deceiver. He's always been the liar. He's always pretended to be somebody that he wasn't. He even pretended to be his brother. So finally, Jacob says, I'm Jacob. I'm the deceiver. I'm second. And it's in that moment of repentance, that moment of honesty and authenticity, that God says, your name will no longer be Jacob. From now on, you will be called Israel. So when this was all taking place, Jacob was actually on his way to meet up with his brother Esau because God had told him to go back to his homeland. So after 20 years, it was 20 years go by. I have a family situation where it's been 20 years. One of my siblings, my sister, some things happened 20 years ago. She made some poor choices in life and did some things that were very hurtful to the family and in a sense has estranged herself and have had not a whole lot to do with her in the last 20 years. And God has convicted me. I'm, I'm going to be reaching out here. 20 years is too long. Even if I'm just going to phone her and just tell her that I love her, what she does is her responsibility, but I'm going to make that phone call to let her know, you know what, I'm your brother, I love you, and we'll see where it goes from there. So 20 years has gone by. Jacob is on his way to meet his brother. Genesis 33.3 says, Jacob looked up and saw Esau coming with his 400 men. Now remember, Jacob ran for his life, and his brother's coming at him with 400 men. So as he approached his brother, he bowed to the ground seven times before him. So we jump to verse 4, and it says, But Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, and they wept. It's a beautiful picture of grace, forgiveness, reconciliation. So remember when Isaac was dying, his mother, with his mother's help, Jacob cheated Esau out of his father's blessing. And Esau would have killed Jacob if Jacob had not fled. Now, here we are 20 years later. Esau comes to meet his brother and forgives him. It's never too late. It's never too late. It brings us to our third point this morning. Reconciliation is our greatest reward. Reconciliation, that is our greatest reward. Our Lord Jesus, he reconciled our relationship with God the Father. From the very beginning, man wanted to be in control and broke the covenant. Adam and Eve chose to eat the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and disobeyed God's instructions. They chose their way over God's way. When we choose to humble ourselves and restore relationships, we are reflecting the very nature of Christ. Because God had a plan to restore all of that. And that plan was to send his one and only son, our Lord Jesus. So we can use the time that we've been given to either bring us closer together or we can distance ourselves from others. When we purpose to put ourselves into a position of posture, a position of, and posture of gathering, we will, we will continue to grow. When we purpose to put ourselves into a position and posture of gathering, we will continue to grow. And this is why we gather every Sunday. And we gather throughout the week so that we can build each other up so that we can be real with one another, so that we can learn to respond the way that God has called us to respond, and that is in love. Because everything hangs off of this. Love God and love others. We may not always get along, but we always put each other first along the way, along the journey. Proverbs 17, 17 says, A friend loves at all times. Everybody say all, all times. And a brother is born for adversity. So in other words, he's got your back. God's got your back. Will you have your brother's back? Or will you have your sister's back? You know, we never know how much time we've got. Right? Don't waste it holding on to a grudge. Instead, 
Give it to God. Would everybody stand with me, please? Thank you. Our takeaway this morning, reconciliation is our greatest reward. This morning, let us lay down and put aside those things that have gotten in the way. Things get in the way. Let's just come with open hearts, open hands to God. It's worth coming together till you can't. You know, we don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. But we do know is that today is the day the Lord has made and his mercies are new every morning. I read that scripture every single day. I thank God that is such an amazing gift that you've given us. Every day we get a fresh start. It's amazing to me. Everything starts with Christ. It all starts with him. You know, when he hung there on that cross, they mocked him. They spit on him. You know, he had all the authority. He had all the power to just smite everybody, take them all out. But instead, he chose to forgive us. He said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. When I'm in a place where I need to forgive somebody, I remember what Jesus said on that cross. That's what I say every time. I remember that it takes me right to that moment. And it gives me that power and it gives me that strength to forgive that person, to let it go and give it to God. You know, sometimes people don't understand the weight of what they're doing. They don't understand that life and death are in the power of the tongue. They don't understand that the wages of sin is death. And that Christ, he came to pay it all. You know, it's hard for us to forgive if we haven't first received forgiveness ourselves. So right now, in this moment, I encourage you to do that right here, right now. Don't go another day. Don't go another moment carrying that weight Whatever it is, bitterness, just let it go and let's give it to God. You know, you can't forgive on your own. You can't even love on your own. We need the love of God, the God who is love. We need him to come in. Paul said in Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe with all your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So I want to give you, give you that opportunity right now to do just that. I'm going to lead you through a prayer. Let this be your moment where you let God in. Let these things go and give them to God. Let go of it. Anything that's holding you down, let it go. So we're going to pray this together as a family. So with all eyes closed and heads bowed, I want you to repeat after me. Say this with all your heart and say it loud enough that you can hear it with your own ears. So repeat after me, dear God in heaven, today is the day I say yes to you. I admit that I have sinned. I ask you to forgive me and cleanse me. I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. I believe with all my heart that Jesus has been raised from the dead. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, I give myself to you. And I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Fill me now to overflowing with your Holy Spirit. I am a believer and I am a child of God. And I thank you for it. Jesus' name. Amen. Let's just stay in this moment. Let's just stay in this moment. If you just said that prayer with all your heart and you just received Jesus as your Lord, put your hand up in the air. Raise your hand up to heaven. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Maybe this was your comeback moment. Maybe you haven't been doing things God's way and you've been doing things your way, but today you said, no, I'm coming back. If that's you today, put your hand up in the air, please. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Well, there is a celebration going on in heaven right now. So let's make some noise and praise our God. Yes. We're
to get into a worship song now and praise our Heavenly Father. Let's get into that funnel, you know. Let's get the heavens rain from heaven into us. If anybody needs prayer, the prayer team will be right over there in the corner. Come on over and get prayer. Let's worship our God. Yes. Well, I'm going to just pop in here, hun. Oh. Just at the moment, we're having some technical difficulties. I'm not able to give the last song. Oh. <laughs> so that's okay. okay. We're just going to continue on in the with the presence of the Lord that's here. We're just going to offer you some next steps here of what you can do. Um, I know as we've heard from the Lord today, I ask that you will just um, let the Lord speak clarity to you as to who you may need to reach out to, a family, a friend, a loved one. And I also just bless you with the grace and the courage to do so because reconciliation is so powerful. It is a kingdom way. Yes. It's the way God wants us to be with one another. We are to love each other. <laughs> so right now, please just have a, have a seat for the moment and we'll give you just a couple next steps. And one of the first things that we want to do is to invite you back. Uh, bring a friend next week. Bring a family member. And uh, bring them so that they can hear the word of God. Um, one of our exciting events that I've been talking about lately is to invite you to our Kingdom Conference. Kingdom a Royals Conference. It's our women's conference in Chilliwack, B.C. And we are knowing that many of you have come and you've booked a place. And so we are so excited to have you. And we're just expecting amazing things to happen to you there. Um, it's also like a really great time to connect, right? All of our women together, we're just going to have such a wonderful time. I know that just expect great, great things. <laughs> we're not designed to do life alone, and doing this helps, you know, just brings you closer and closer together with one another. Um, I know that the men met yesterday morning for their men's gathering, their breakfast that they have every month. I'm sure it was a wonderful time together. And then also in connecting, I know that Sharon also leads a women's group on Friday mornings. So your women, you're welcome to join her as well and get some details from her. So maybe, hon, if you would just share with us how we can grow. Okay. I don't need I the mic. I got, I got one of these. Yes, you do. <laughs> it's built in. <laughs> <laughs> how are we going to grow? What's our next step? Well, the first way and the most important way that we're going to grow is reading God's Word. You know, this, this book doesn't just contain his word, it is his word. It's alive and it's powerful. It's spirit, food for our spirit, man. It will guide us and it will direct us in everything in life. You know, I say this once in a while, Bible, basic instructions before leaving earth, right? Anything and everything you're ever going to need to know or go yeah. through, it's right here. We need to be in his word and be guided by him every single day. Another way that we go is through our tithes and offerings. We believe in the principle of the tithe, which we give God our first 10%. We put him first. It's, a, it's not just a bucket plucking. It's a form of worship to our God that yes. says, Lord, we trust you. Yes. He knew this would be a hard one. He said in Malachi 3, test me in this. It's the only place in the Bible that God says to test him. Mm -hmm. If I will not open the heavens and yeah. pour out for you such a blessing, it cannot be contained. Yes. So uh, with our tithes and our offerings, we worship God. And it is a way that we grow because we trust in him. So I'm going to pray over the offering, and then we're going to close. Well, Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you that we have this opportunity to worship you with our tithes and our offering. We thank you for your promise of abundant blessings, Lord. And we just thank you for this day as we move forward now in, the, in our, what we're about to do and where we're going to go. Lord, we just thank you that you have blessed us continually. In Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to invite up Pastor Ron. And the mic went off. Oh, it's, yes. Right. But that's for you. It was like a s slow strobe light this morning with our uh, technical. They would come on and go off, come on, go off. Anyways, um, Pastor, or Pastor, Rick and Kamla have come up from our Chilliwack Victory Church for two months. Uh, if you haven't been here, I have just been recovering from uh, open heart surgery. And, uh, but I feel now that it's time to get back in the saddle. So next Sunday, I'm going to begin preaching uh, again. So there you go. And, but in the meantime, 
we want to continue to build our relationship with College Street Victory Church in Chilliwack uh, because they're part of our family. And it, it, this message was a good dovetail because our next series is called Rooted, The Essentials. And it basis is what a good and healthy family looks like, both naturally and spiritually. And so that will be our series next. But we just want to say, and we want to give a great hand to Rick and Kama because they've been awesome, haven't they? And so we won't see them regularly anymore, but we could if I decide that I need a medical discharge again. <laughs> but, but <laughs> it's not my plan, but you never know those plans. Anyways, I, I'll go on a rabbit tail if I don't go there. But anyways, uh, Tara Lee, we're just gonna, we're just gonna pray over them, but I, if Tara Lee's got a couple words to say. No, I, we just can't even thank you enough for the love and the support um, uh, in-house, out-house, you know, out, outside of the house. Sorry. <laughs> keep it there. Sorry. Um, both on a personal level and uh, as a corporate level, and we are just so grateful. We know you guys are incredibly uh, anointed and called of God, um, have, has got great plans and purposes for you, and so we are excited to see how things unfold uh, for you guys as we are excited to see how things unfold for us here too. Um, so we just want to take a minute and honor you and thank you uh, from the bottom of our heart. Thank you. And you know, again, we couldn't have done this. They, they wouldn't have come if we didn't have a relationship with Chilliwack. Vital, vital, vital. So anyway to you and we're going to pray over you guys so let's just stretch out our hands and let's just pray over rick and kamala thank you lord jesus father we thank you for the call that is on their life i thank you that there are leaders in the church family that are part of in chilliwack and father i just pray 